Welcome everybody, Amcar Leadership University. This hour segment, we're gonna be talking about nurturing the future leaders of the game. We're, we're sitting here recording at the Gathering of, uh, Gathering of the Clans 2017, and we've got a nice uh, spectrum of experience in the game. So, as is typical with Amcar Leadership University, all I'm gonna do is ask, starting from my left and going to the right, a brief introduction about yourself, and if there's any foot stomps or key items you wanna make sure we discuss today. Uh, please include again your name and where you currently play. Uh, I'm Calebra Fallstar. Uh, I'm from West March. Uh, I've been in the game 20 plus years. Um, as far as things that I'd really like to make sure get discussed today is how, I mean obviously the nurturing, but uh, things that are universal between kingdoms, um, things that can be set down in stone and used almost like uh, Leadership 101. For new, for new leaders, something that anybody could read from the ALU and move forward with. Thank you. Uh, I'm Kai. I am uh, I play Automatics Keep, which is out of the Rising Winds. I am a first-time monarch. Uh, I would like to uh, for, for just people uh, stepping up into leadership roles, don't be afraid. There's many myriads of being afraid and. I know a lot of people do get a little intimidated, especially when they're sitting next to M-Hog. <laughs> um, yeah, I'm Michael Hammer of God. Uh, I play out of Minneapolis, Minnesota right now. Um, I'm in my fourth different Amp Guard Kingdom over a, a 29 almost year career. And the, the central takeaway that I hope everybody who watches this video gets is that um, AmpGuard has good leadership roles for every single one of you. Now, figuring out how to be successful in it is not the same for everyone. Figuring out which role is not the same for everyone because different people have different skill sets, different things they like to do. But AmpGuard is a volunteer organization. Our leadership is volunteer also. Everybody can find a place to do it, and a large part of nurturing is helping match people with that right place. Hello, everybody. I am Ram Kutetsilian out of Rivermore. I play out of Koreanatema. This is my second reign as the Emperor slash King of Rivermore. And I've been playing for roughly 10 years, active in eight of those, and Mhog nailed what I was going to say right on the head. Uh, anybody can be a leader. It all take, it all just involves finding their strengths. What makes, what, well, what can they take out of what they're great at and how they can transfer that into a leadership role? And as soon as you find what they're really good at, it's easy to find what kind of leadership they're good for. And that's what I really want to focus on. <clears throat> Hi, I'm uh, Barrage. Play out of Burning Lands. Uh, one of the things that I really want to address is that <clears throat> new leaders, that they're eager, they want to do it, but they might not know what questions to ask. They, they might not know what things need to be addressed, how a park is run. Um, the different roles within within the kingdom, uh, just all of that, kind of guiding them and, and pointing out things that they might not have known to ask. Okay, great. So obviously, very broad topic. So really, who knows where this conversation is going to go? Um, but those are some great points. We're going to make sure that, that we definitely foot stomp uh, as many of those and address as many of them as we possibly can. Um, so, Michael, I'm going to start with you. How do I motivate somebody? Let me st take a step back. How do I recognize that maybe it's time for somebody to, to take that next step or to assume a leadership role? So one of the things I like to see the most from leaders isn't uh, a skill as much as it's a, it's a, it's a, a trait. Okay. I want to see people who are uh, excited. They have good ideas um, or even Ideas that I don't think are good, but might be. Because one of the things, one of the very first things I ever had given to me as a piece of AmpGuard advice, and this has to have been in the, in the early 90s, um, and I don't remember who gave it to me, but the advice was AmpGuard thrives on different people's visions. Okay? It really doesn't matter if Randall is the best AmpGuard leader we've ever seen. And... He is considerate with everybody. He has fantastic ideas and expresses them well, which, by the way, are all the traits I believe Randall has. But AmpGuard is better if Randall only leads some of the time. 
and other people with other ideas that may inherently not be as good or as fully developed lead other parts of the time because we've got hundreds and hundreds of people here. They aren't going to all like what I like or what Randall likes or what anyone else likes. And it is very easy for amp card leaders, especially old amp card leaders, to get set in their ways and to not grasp the new and exciting ideas. So it is super critical to look for somebody who's got ideas and wants to share those ideas, even if they're not great at sharing them yet, even if the ideas aren't great. Now, obviously, if you've got a new person who's got a great idea, they're better than a new person without. But if you're talking about what do I do for my park leadership? Do I retread somebody who was pretty good, but not great? Or do I try and get this new person who has some potential because they've got some ideas, but not much else? Oh my God, you go with the new person every time. New person every time? Everybody agree with that? I know I, I, I stole a little bit out of the context, but I'm just trying to create some conversation because we all like to say we agree with Michael. So I disagree. Yeah, I disagree. Yeah. Whoa. Just, um, not new person every time. Um, sometimes those new people who are excited need to team up with someone who has the experience. And, and that right there is going to get them ready to step up because they're able to work alongside someone who has that experience. And then that experienced player is going to get a reminder of what it is to be young, to be eager, and they're going to collaborate really well. And both of them are going to benefit. And then that kingdom is going to benefit. So try and find that best of both worlds, right? A mentor mentee yeah. relationship. Yes. Okay. So what can I do? How can I nurture leadership? How can I nurture and create a world where people are comfortable sharing those ideas with me, Michael? Because that's intimidating, right? Actually, we'll, we'll, Romku, before we get to Michael, how do, I create, how do I create an environment where people can share their ideas? Because maybe I play in a park where it's a bunch of old timers, but I got passion, I've got interest, and I got some thoughts. Well, the biggest thing is just getting that information out there. You can have all these amazing ideas, but if you don't open them up and let people see your viewpoint or even explaining your viewpoint, that's the most important thing. If you just keep it to yourself, then you may have these great ideas. Nothing's going to be done. So even if you have a park that has an extremely different kind of culture, it's still, it's letting that person understand that taking that step and letting them know what your ideas are and the ideas and experiences behind them, you're going to get other people to open up and even support you in those ideas if they're great enough. So just getting yourself out there, getting your points understood, and it's going to blossom into something even better than what they originally came up with. Calibre, you had something? I, I kind of wanted to further define what he was saying. I wanted to say something very similar, but I think it comes down to a key word of communication. Um, if you're not communicating with those, I mean, it's pretty easy to tell who has the drive. Who's, who's showing up every weekend and, and pulling people into battle games. It's pretty easy to see those people that are eager, but if you don't ever talk to them, if you don't ever encourage them, if you don't ever communicate that it's okay to step out of their comfort zone, then they're never gonna take that chance. So to me, it comes down to communication above everything else. Okay. And communication to share my ideas or to, to encourage people to share their ideas? Both, to encourage dialogue. Communication is a two-way street. I mean, I can talk forever, but if I'm not listening and not hearing, I'm not really communicating. I'm just speaking. So creating an environment where communication is not only acceptable but encouraged is, in my opinion, the basis of encouraging new leaders. Okay. Kai, then Michael. Uh, um, kind of want to like piggyback what they were saying. A lot of people that I've talked to, They've come to me saying, I want to be the monarch of my park, or I want to run for a kingdom position, or I want to autocrat an event. They seem to be afraid to do that. And I think that's where like the mentorship will help with that. And also just letting them know it's okay to be afraid and it's okay to ask for help. You don't have to do you don't have to be right the, the very first time. If you have a question, don't please don't be afraid to reach out and help and ask for help from others. It's just like an, it's an intimidation thing because like a lot of people are intimidated by people that wear the white belts around 
their waist or have all these fancy titles. Michael? Um, so uh, what I wanted to say piggybacks really well on, on what Kai, Kai just said. Now, of course I agree with mentorship as a, as a great way to train people. I think that's, that's, that's obvious. I've been successful with it when I've done it. I believe in it strongly. But that fear factor, and it's inherent. It doesn't go away. But the job of old leaders and of all old amp carters is fight that tendency. When a new person comes up with an idea that sounds like an idea you tried five years ago that didn't work, do not jump on them immediately and go, no, that stinks, we did it, it sucks. Because that adds to the fear factor. In fact, I honestly believe that that is one of the biggest contributors to the fear factor. New amp carters are afraid to get their ideas out there and to communicate like we were talking about because they get shut down very quickly. And that's not to say that we do not want the experience of veterans to say, boy, five years ago, when we tried the idea like that, it didn't work. But as a veteran, it's, it's obligatory on all of us not to have that reaction be, no, your idea is bad because we tried it five years ago and it failed. But instead, okay, that idea was, was one we thought was good five years ago, but it failed. Here's why. How do we make yours work? and approach it with that direction. And we fail to do that way too often. And it, it adds to the fear factor that Kai was talking about. If you're a new guy in your park and the three, the three night veterans who, who come to your park jump down your throat on your first good idea, we will never know your second. Kai, is failure okay? Yeah. I think uh, failure is okay because it will help you learn and it humbles you somewhat because we can't all be, we can't all, all be great. I mean, we would like to think we're all great, but once I feel that once people get to that point where everything's going okay and like just everyone, everything's uh, just like coming up aces for them then they feel they can't learn anything else. And so with that failure, that humbles, I, th I think that will humble somebody to the point where, okay, maybe I need to take a look at myself, reevaluate wh what I'm doing and try new ideas, uh, talk to like the new people, and like, knocking them down a peg. I don't want to use that term, but sure. sometimes it's needed. Well, and I think, again, and it's been a recurring theme actually through the panels today as we've talked a lot about people are so afraid of failure, right? But really, like Michael just elaborated, that's where the lessons come through. So, mm -hmm. hey, I want to try this exact same thing again, which it's never exactly the same because it's different people, different environment, right? But, oh, hey, by the way, these were the challenges that it faced before in a struggle. Even the successes, hey, here's the, where we struggled in the past. Let's address those up front as opposed to you walking into the same wall, right? Or skinning the same knees. And we need to address those more. And I think, again, and, and this is the first time I've brought it up, but each of the panels today, there's been some conversations about remembering to learn from, from those mistakes and sharing them, not just hiding behind them and, and working towards the next award. So well, a little bit of editorial, please. I was saying, and I, I think I mean, your question was, is failure okay? I think failure is unavoidable. I think the more you put yourself out there, there's so many perspectives in AmpGuard that you're, you're never going to make everybody happy and you're never going to do it 100% right 100% of the time. So... You're, I mean, this being about nurturing leaders, I think it's important to tell them that it's okay to fail. It's about mitigating that failure as much as possible and making it the most successful event it can be for what it is. So letting them know that it's okay to fail. It's, a, it's okay to make a mistake and fix that mistake and own up to it when you do it. Because you're not going to avoid failure your entire empire career. I don't know a single leader on this panel behind the cameras that hasn't tried something and failed at it at least once in their empire career. So... Barrage and then Michael. <clears throat> um, I think one of the ways to go into the idea of failure, it, lack of a better term, but the idea of failure with, with the newer um, generation of leaders is uh, two positives and a negative. Like, yes, there is the negative, hey, that, that didn't work out, but here's a couple things along the way that, that were really good. I think that if we just you know, went this direction, like with a feast or something, you're like, you know, this was really good. This was really good. Give them some positive feedback rather than, hey, you failed this time, but we're going to do it better next time. Um, they have to feel, I feel like we need to know that some of what we did 
worked and, and, and know that it worked. And that helps us understand the failure better is, is that we knew that these parts were successful. We can recognize that as well. And then we, we come to terms with that failure and we can push past it. And I, I agree with, with everything they've said, but I think another key attribute of failure and one that I, I emphasize, especially with um, maybe not the brand newest leaders, but the people who are hitting their stride, starting to feel like they're good, they have failures. Disaster recovery is one of the most important leadership skills. And not all of the disasters are of your own, your own making. So it's not just you have a failure, you need to learn disaster recovery. But when one of my squires had a problem with one of his events, and it was relatively his mistake, I was like, okay, that's done. Now it's time to prove your mettle by, by how do you make this right? How do you recover from this problem? And I, I think you cannot uh, ignore the chances to shine that come from disasters, including yours, your, your own failures. Well, we're using a broad term of failure, right? And that's a challenge because I think failure is definitely in the eye of the beholder because something can be, I think one of the, the challenges that, again, recurring theme, I apologize for the editorial, but like sometimes you succeed in everybody's eyes, but your own, mm. right? Where, well, the feast wasn't exactly what I wanted because I really wanted you know, Cornish hens, but instead we did fried chicken. Well, the key was to make sure everybody had a good filling meal and enjoyed the event. So you didn't get Cornish hens because that's what you wanted, but the other 299 people on site through disaster uh, recovery or whatever, you succeeded there, hero, right? We forget that sometimes we don't define what success is. We work on trying to highlight what the failure was. Kai, again, I apologize, Kai. Oh, I kind of want to, um, the whole like disaster recovery thing. It's a matter of learning not to be too hard on yourself. I mean, being hard on yourself does help you a little bit along the way. With like, like you have the drive, but it could also hinder you in a bit, in a bit or hinder you a bit. So maybe you don't trust somebody to be feastocrat so you have to do like so you want to be feastocrat or just you're trying to do everything yourself and then that burns you out and then just everything ends up crashing down around you uh i've seen uh, a few leader a few potential leaders over in rising winds where they tried to do everything themselves and instead of reaching out to help or not to, and not taking any advice any advice they burned out, everything came crashing down around them. And instead of looking around them to see like what went wrong, they just up and quit. And I feel we also lose potential good leaders that way. Okay, so let's talk a little bit, obviously broad scope when we start talking about nurturing future leaders. So we're actually gonna go through a little bit of an exercise in a moment before we do. Uh, Ramku, how can I encourage maybe somebody who's a little bit shy? Now, somebody who's a little bit shy, and I actually do have experience with this in my regent out there, uh, it is taking, it goes back to finding what they're good at and showing that they can provide that strength and help them bring out that extrovert within themselves. So for example, say you have somebody who's really shy but absolutely loves to draw and they're awesome at it. It's encouraging them that this is a very great skill you have here. Now, you should show this to other people and then when they ask you about it, show them how to step up and the techniques that you learned to get to where you're at. It's finding that venue that they're the most comfortable with and getting them to just a little bit at a time, just expose that part about themselves. Because a little before you know it, you could have just one artist becoming like a small circle of people that are all learning the same trait and then growing to even a bigger circle. So like if you're an introvert and you really love numbers and you love organizing data, Talk, having them open themselves up to other prime ministers and understand that, you know, you have this really great skill and this could benefit the game. You should give this a try and know that you have this awesome support network of past prime ministers behind you. And with their time and the more they step into it, they're going to get more comfortable with not only doing that, just being more extroverted in general. Okay, so let's run a little bit of an exercise. We're gonna run from, from right to left and I'm just gonna kind of try and pave the way, if you will, in the growth of a park. 
and talk about the different scenarios as we go, right? Because in the beginning, somebody starts to park. So they're energetic, they're excited, and we'll give them the first year, right? So they're probably in a perfect world, they're approaching barony numbers, they've established themselves in the kingdom as far as somebody, hey, the land is established, and, and we're looking forward to what comes next for that land. So broad with that in mind, that leader wants to play amp guard. They're, they're done being the monarch, right? They've done a year term. Now they're, they're hopeful. They want to see it grow and they want to be able to start playing, participating. Um, what are some things that that leader needs to be thinking about? Young leader, young park, trying to create a, a little bit of a succession program. What comes to your mind? I think whenever any park starts off, there's that uh, contingency of like, like a core group and they all are, you know, they have the same ideals uh, they're all pushing towards that same like they're like we want it we want to play um, we want our own park uh, I believe that whoever was that individual who stepped up he's I'm gonna be the sheriff I'm gonna I'm gonna make sure that you know everything gets handled and so that we can play he needs to reach out to that core and be like you know eventually one of you is gonna need to move into this role let me show you what I do uh, let me explain the role um, you know and just kind of get everyone excited about it don't talk about I'm so burnt out. I don't want to do this anymore because then the other ones are like, well, we've been here the whole time. Why would I want to do it? You know, um, just find a way to make it uh, like a positive light and like, you know, I, hey, I'm going to pass the mantle to you. It's a positive thing. Now it's your turn. And, and that is going to help push the park into the next level because that next person is like, you did it. Now I'm going to do it. Mm -hmm. And then I'm going to try to do it really well as well and, and model off of some of the things that I saw you do but I'm going to, I'm going to put my little spin on it and with themes, having a, having a cool theme, you know, and, and getting them excited about that theme and just constantly just grabbing and moving towards just building and building, running demos, just everything that that park needs to grow and to thrive. But having that core that, that started and, and passing the mantle and as more come in, reaching out and bringing them in and it just, and then you just have like this pool of talent that that'll lead the park okay so so a little bit idealistic but that's our goal right is we've got that core yeah so now we've hit barony a little bit of a of, a, of an itch maybe for duchy who knows but my core they're getting tired because you know what the monarch becomes the regent becomes the champion becomes the regent becomes the monarch that cycle right so now we're a couple of years in uh we're an established i'm getting to play uh in office, I'm getting to play the game every once in a while. Mm -hmm. What are some tips that I'm becoming stagnant? And then how do I avoid those tips? Ramku. All righty. It's to find the way to things. becoming stagnant from the, the official burnout, especially if you're taking that kind of a rotation. Uh, I think with, honestly, with Barrage, what he pointed out with, uh, <laughs> while you're in office, it's not just about doing your job. It's about letting other people see what kind of work you're putting into it. So, like, for example, if you're a PM and you're entering credits, you're like, well, this is how I do it. You take all this information here and you let them have, like, a first-person glance of your job. And then, like, especially if you're sheriff or now at this point baron and you're growing your way to duchy, it's, well, when you're a baron, this is, these are your responsibilities. And this is what I do to make sure that these things come off right. And even teaching the future leaders that it's okay to delegate, like uh, Kai was talking about earlier. Having people know you shouldn't have to carry all the way by yourself. You're, you're in, a, in a way, you're already delegating to new leaders coming up because you're showing them how to do the job and getting them motivated. And then if you're hitting those barony numbers and you already have like a fresh leader who's a first time baron, it's having them even taking that mantle of these are the things that I have learned and I'm a new baron and these are what I can show you and then still have that support network for even that next generation for them and then the leaders behind them. So I think building that great open line of transparency into what we do in office and having that transparency is going to make that growth from coming to Shire to a barony and even the barony to the duchy even easier. So Michael, my park is spoiled. We've got this core group that's led us to on the brink of duchy numbers. We're looking forward to the future. Um, that sustained the, the, that core a little bit, but they know duchy's about to happen. And to them, they're taking a deep breath. They're looking forward to it. What do I do when I've got a, a populace that's so used to that core that they're really not energizing. They're not, they're not providing a lot of stuff and they don't feel like they're, how do I get that new generation to step forward and keep the torch going? So you have to look for 
uh, any spark of inspiration. And it doesn't always come out um, positively. Often it does, and that's always nice. But if, if you hear somebody at the park say, my God, are we playing another node cap game? That's your opportunity to say, now this guy is somebody I need to think about. Could he be somebody we get into the championship? Is it that subtle? Oh, I think it is. Because that's somebody who already says, if I was doing it, I would do it better. Okay? He's already saying, this is not what it could be. It could be better. Now, of course, if you've got somebody who says, I want to run this six-month campaign with these kind of battle games and this kind of storyline and all these props and NPCs, that's great. But we're not talking about, about a park where somebody outside the core is already that excited. It wouldn't be a challenge then. We're talking about you're not quite sure who to find outside the core. You look first for people who've got that positive inspiration. If you don't see that, look for people who have that negative inspiration. Get the person from the core who is the closest to those people and or the most charismatic to go talk to them and say, hey, I heard you complain about those, those node caps. I know a lot of people like them, but you might be right. What kind of games do you think we should be running? How would we do that? What's a good way to make that happen? Get them excited about games. They already care about games. They've talked about it. And it doesn't have to be games. It could be games. It could be awards. It could be feasts. It could be ANS. Any part of your, your amp guard experience. I talk about games because it's what I care about the most and what I think is the most central to a successful duchy. Um, but it could be any part. When somebody is talking about that part and sees room for improvement, that's somebody who could be your visionary. They might be a malcontent. Malcontents who have no vision also exist, and you have to evaluate that. But the fact is, a lot of malcontents are actually people who have a vision and are scared. Okay? So when I'm out there trying to get my group to grow, I listen around the park, I watch the Facebook, I see who's frustrated, because those are the people you can nurture growth. So uh, this is a drum between Michael and Kai. You two are off to the side talking. You said, you know what? That young, that young, I keep wanting to go military. That young individual over there, uh, she's interested in running battle games. Okay. You're not in office. What do you do to support them? Um, I would probably go over to them, talk to them, figure out what exactly battle games they want to do, and then encourage them to go talk to the people that are in office. Because a lot of people will have this idea in their head of, well, I'm not an officer, I have no pull or sway, so I can't do anything but sit off to the side and complain. No, you can come talk to us. In fact, I know many park leaders, kingdom leaders, will love for people to come and talk to them. Because if you sit on your idea, it goes nowhere, it does nothing. If you sit on your complaint, all it does, all that does is just eat you away inside and you become bitter and then you start lashing out and then you become that malcontent that is just a malcontent with no ideas. Um, and I, I, I love what Kai said. Um, the answer that popped into my head when you asked the question is I cheat. I take her, I take her to my garage, show her the prop locker and say, what can you use to make your game awesome? <laughs> because... And it's cheating because I have all that stuff after years and years of collecting garbage. But that, that kind of direct inspiration and support quickly turns malcontents into people who are excited. Because they've got ideas. They wouldn't be talking about wanting to fix things. I actually have a, I have a girl. She's from a, I have a lady. She's from a, one of the neighboring, neighboring parks. She's a cross gamer from DAG. And she just heard about everything that we've done at Keep, um, at Rising Winds events, at uh, like other kingdoms. And she's kind of, I kind of want to run like this quest storyline with like props and stuff and say, cool, let's do this. Well, I'm not an officer. No, I will help you. I, it's like, I, I guess I'm the monarch of the kingdom. And so I'm, I'm not going to micromanage the parks, but I will help you in any way you can. I will point you into the dire like to the direction of the park monarchs. I will point you to the direction of the game designers. I will just, let's do this. Well, that bridging the gap. Yeah. yeah. 
So congratulations. Your duchy's going strong. When, as you, as the founder, you've watched it grow. You're so proud of it. Now you finally got duchy and that was your entire goal. Kai, this one's still on you. When's it a time that you're not hovering and you're not watching anymore? When did you, when will you stop that? Or when did you stop that? I think it, I don't think there's a good fit all answer for that. Um, Cause you can technically do that if you're at barony status or all the way up to like principality status or grand duchy status. It's a matter of kind of feeling out how the leadership is going to proceed, whether or not they're strong, uh, they're willing to take on new responsibilities to help uh, foster growth, not just like bringing in new people, but passing along the skills of leadership, of game designs, of ANS, um, when, um, just well, whatever. And like I said, that can either be at barony level or that could be up all the way up to principality level. And there was still will be some sort of like parent child thing going on. But along those lines, you have to let your kid grow up and leave the nest. So congratulations, our, our little growing land of our core five people here has, has become a kingdom. You let them grow out of the nest, you're watching them grow and things like that. What are some tips that you're trying to pass on and create a, an environment that nurtures leadership? And that's such a broad question. Um, it's a broad topic. Yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> I, I think there are a couple of key words. They're almost excusably keyword uh, in this situation. A lot of that is passion. Um, you know, he talks about, or Michael talked about uh, malcontents. To me, malcontents, I and mean, he kind of talked, he kind of brushed on this. Malcontent, malcontention is usually passion unanswered. Uh, it's usually not feeling like you can get those things that are driving you out into the thing. And finding those people and communicating and being kind, uh, letting them know that this is a game of passion. It's a game of, you know, we're here to express who we are and nothing is, no idea is wrong. So letting them know, hey, I'm not going to run this event for you, but I'm going to be here every step of the way. I have your back every step of the way. Feel free to make mistakes. If I see you going too, too far off the rails, I have your back. And just letting them do it. You know what I mean? Like, I have a friend who just spent a year as a, a monarch of a, of a very small park. And she would overthink everything. Every idea was, was 20 hours of, of, oh my gosh, what if this happens? What if this happens? And I told her, I said, if you, if you keep thinking it through and never doing it, it's never going to happen. Sometimes you just have to push them out the nest. And when they start to falter, you pick them up. But hopefully they fly. And if they do, then the next time they jump out the nest, they won't need you to guide them. They'll fly on their own. So for me, it's finding those people with passion and encouraging them to know that they can make mistakes and move forward. So just kind of dawned on me, we've got all, everybody here has significant experience at kingdom level officers. So let's talk a little bit about that, what you can do from that position to, to cultivate that across the kingdoms, okay? Specifically right now, um, what are some things you can do if you see that maybe you got some, that core hasn't let go and they're not allowing fresh blood in? What are some tips Either, I guess we'll say formal or informal, but, but Ramku, what are some things you would do if you realized that maybe some of your future leaders are being choked out by toxic leadership? In, a, in that kind of situation where there's kind of a stranglehold with like your popular personalities in a park, I would reach out to them in the sense of going, I love what you guys are doing, but it's something that we can't do forever. There's going to get to that point where even as officers, no matter how great you are, there's going to be that point where you're going to need the break and need the burnout. So when that happens, whenever somebody has a burnout, you want to find, try to find an other like spark that lights a new fire in a different direction. So like, for example, if you're a fighter that's fought for an incredibly long time and you break your arm, you can't fight anymore. It's like, well, I can't fight anymore, but I've always wanted to draw and it gives them a spark in a different area. So when it comes to a group that has a stranglehold, it's like, 
you guys have done so great at being leaders, but what if you took your lessons and you taught them to a new generation? So that way you guys don't have to do this forever. And you can just be the supporting cast behind this new group rising and coming in. So it's just letting them open themselves up to like, you guys are leaders, but it's time to transition into being teachers and give them a new purpose. And that's going to help push their drive. That's kind of like a challenge too. It's like, okay, I'm a great leader, but now he's asking me to be a good teacher. Okay, I'll do it. And it gives them a new motivation to push up the next rank. I, I just had this conversation uh, with a leader of a park. And the, the only argument I could use to convince them it was time to let go was what happens if something happens to you and you haven't prepared your park for your absence? And getting them to realize that it was as much their responsibility, like he said, to be a teacher and to teach future generations as it was to be a leader. Because any of us could get in a car accident tomorrow. Any of us could. And if you're the only reason your park is aflame and you are gone, the park dies. And it's your responsibility to nurture that spark in others. So that's the, the argument that almost basically has become my, my, my baseline argument now is you need to prepare people for your absence. Isn't that the challenge though? Michael, am I creating, if I want to be recognized as a leader, does that mean I have to hold on the reins as long as possible in order to get that crown belt? Um, well, theoretically maybe, but it's really, it's really only about five or six points um, to get to the qualification. And in most kingdoms, more important than the qualification is, can you convince the circle of knights that you're a leader and nurturing leaders is probably better at it than anything else you're going to do. And you bring up knighthood, it's another tool. And, and I like his tool, but knighthood's a great tool. If I got a strangling park leadership, I'm going to tell him, look, you're never going to get your, your, your belt with the gold trim if you don't do something for the kingdom. So it's time for you to get your park in order so you can do better things. And you really have to. And if that person is actually motivated by a belt, then they will often say, okay, and get their park in good order because they know that's the, the spark they're going to need to win a kingdom election. That's valuable too. Um, and I'm not saying that knighthood is always a perfect motivator. It has its value, um, both positive and negative. But certainly if you're telling me I've got someone who is motivated by that and is worried about their points, there's no better points than Kingdom Monarch. And frankly, not only is it more points, but many night circles, it's the points that actually count. Is that a consideration, and this is just out there, again, since everybody's been a Kingdom Monarch, um, has that been a consideration, their, their training and nurturing of others when we're starting to look for those 8th, ninth, 10th orders of the ward? Or is it more just what they've accomplished as a leader? There's no wrong answer. Just so, answer. it is absolutely 100% a requirement if I'm going to give somebody a white belt. It is not absolutely a requirement to give them high orders, but it's a huge plus. Okay? And it probably is a requirement for 10th service orders, for example. So we talked a little bit about whenever it's the official leadership of the park that might be the, the stifling block, and, and I want this to be more positive, but what about it when it's just that informal leadership out at the park? Uh, has anybody had any experience with that, having to, to try and get some of those informal leaders to step back and, and let some, some new blood take the reins? Hmm. Okay. What I did, it was more or less, I don't want to say confronting, but confronted. Like there was a lot of um, negativity coming from these informal leaders. And it was a, okay, what have we done wrong? Please tell me so we can fix this. And it's like we go from there. Um, some I know we don't want to be confrontational, but and that's kind of like a bad word. Unfortunately, sometimes we do have to be confrontational, or even you can just call it like, "Hey, let's sit down and like have a talk." But you need to address those informal leaders, just because I've seen a lot of the times those informal leaders are 
also toxic in a way. And they're the ones creating the schisms in your population, whether it's at a, a park level, um, a principality level, or a kingdom level. And we're not all going to get, we're not all going to get along and be best of friends, but you can't be actively working against the leadership because that doesn't really help out anybody. It's either, it's either enjoy the ride or step up and help make the ride better. If I can add on to it. Yeah. Uh, when it comes to those kind of conversations, you can actually use it as a tool for that up and coming leader. So when you have that informal leadership, that's like, well, there's these things that I don't like. It's having, being that bridge between them, yourself, and that new leader to, like you were saying, have a powwow about it. And then that way you can have those informal leadership talk about why their the complaints are there, uh, what they think they can do better, having their insight, and then having your future leader come back and saying, well, I'm doing this for these reasons. And then you're creating that whole pool of different ideas and then once all that information is gathered, that might help that future leader win over those informal leaders or even get more support from them. So using that as a building block to help your leader get used to confronting situations, gathering ideas, and either fortifying their own if they're great enough, modifying it based on the input if there's some ideas that mesh with theirs, or even going, you know what, that's a way better idea and I'll support it and help them with it. It's going to help them be better conflict managers and delegators in the future. And hopefully those informal leaders will transition over to the formal leaders and then we have the new leaders. Bingo. I've seen a different perspective on that uh, in a couple of parts uh, over the course of my, my career. And a lot of that to me has come from, I wouldn't say veterans that are, are no longer in power, no longer making decisions. Um, they tend to stagnate. They still have all that passion. They still have all that drive, but they're no longer in charge. And sometimes they don't know how to let go. And I found that one of the greatest ways to, to, to mitigate that or to refocus all that passion is to give them something else to do. Um, as an example, uh, one of the smaller parks in Westmarch, uh, we have some veterans who didn't quite start the park they're in, but they are years and years and years ahead of every other player and whatnot. And they kind of are stagnant and, and um, disrupted in their, their chatter in the background. Uh, and then uh, over the course of the last year, uh, some of the leadership in that park got them interested in running quest lines, like big, super involved, like six month quest lines. And now, the, you know, like instead of sitting in the background and, and talking, 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 they're putting out advertising and, and questioning and pulling in NPCs and they got their, their passion reignited, they got that spark transferred, and now they're super excited to be doing this new thing, and they've let go of the other range because their hands are so busy. So I think that like, the passion doesn't die just because you've been doing it for 10 years. You know what I mean? I mean, it, gets a, it can come and go, but finding new, what, like uh, I think it was you that said, finding new, new creative ways to use that spark in ways they've never done before will usually help them feel like they're making a difference, they're being important, they're, their contributions are, are um, important to the growth of the park, and then they tend to settle into that new role. It's just that when, you, when you've been in charge for so long and you don't have anything else to do, you tend to fall back on old habits or you want to see things the way the good old days were, where we walked uphill with PVC shield or plywood shields both ways in the snow. So I think, yeah, finding new ways to incite that passion in veterans is probably the best way to do that, in my opinion. Michael? I literally could not love that answer more than I do. <laughs> That was fantastic. <laughs> well, that brings us to uh, about a close on our 45-minute on our block. I almost said second. 45-minute block. Um, as typical, if you would, imagine somebody's only going to watch the last five minutes. What I would ask just each of you, starting from my right to my left, um, what do you want to make sure that they either gets through to them or maybe a point that we didn't get a chance to explore forward? Barrage? Don't be afraid to ask. Don't, don't be afraid to reach out to people that you might have never said anything to. Recognize greatness in others and recognize it in yourself. <clears throat> we can't do this on our own and neither can you. Um, events like this, like clan, there's so many people working together, people that have not said two words to each other possibly, but you have to realize that 
if you want it to move forward, you have to, you have to put your foot in as well. It, it takes everyone. And, and ask questions. Hey, how did you do that? How did you make this happen? I want to do that. Um, the, the young players, asking the older players, the older players, they want to flex their knowledge. They want to tell you how they did it. So ask them. Get them, get them excited about the idea of them telling you. And, and be excited about the information that you're receiving because it's going to make you better. If, if, even if there's only some of it that you're going to use, that's fine. Use some of it. And then use some of yours. And then mix it all together and then we'll get something really cool. And I want to see it and I want to go to that. I want to be there for that. So I'm going to interject real quick because you said something in there that I think that I would like to add. And that's when I, I, other new leaders get me excited. And then next thing you know, I've ran past them and I've grabbed them by the belt and we're running together and they're just struggling to keep up. And I think, I know it's a challenge that I have. And I would just ask everybody else to consider that too, because it reignites my fire. And I'm like, and we can do this 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 and we can do it 10 times bigger. We can do it now. And their eyes are the size of, of dinner plates, right? Like, uh, oh, okay. You know, because then they don't want to disappoint. They want to try and keep up. And then all of a sudden they are wore out or I've stolen their dream from them that they were excited about. So I would um, exercise caution in that. Again, maybe I'm alone. I don't think I am, but uh, <laughs> maybe I'm alone in that. But if you find yourself doing that and you're no longer supporting but you've overrode that person, then uh, take a step back and get back into the chair. Definitely. So, thank yeah. you for, for helping me remember that lesson. Sorry to jump in there. Ron Kuz, back Alrighty, to you. I'd say for me, and something we didn't really talk about here, but I think it's a really good idea too. But if you want to be a leader and you have doubts if you can do it, anybody can be a leader if you really think about it. And even throughout your life, you may have already been a leader in one way or another. For example, if you've been on uh, like a lead role at a play that you did at your school, if you were the head or even the assistant of a student council, if in your mundane life you're a manager or a shift leader, you already have leadership traits that can be easily transferred over to the Amp Guard and even help you be a better leader. And then involving Amp Guard itself, there may be drives you already have that might help you be a good leader. If you're a really personable person, or very social, very charismatic, you already have one of the really key things it takes to being a good leader, is getting yourself out there. So if you're really thinking about yourself, like, I don't know if I have the right slack, trust me, you can probably find something in your life, whether it's mundane or amped guard, you already have qualities of being a great leader. It's just reaching out to that support group and let us help you flourish that and help you be a better leader in yourself. Um, so I, I hit on this a little bit, but I think it's important enough. I'm going to come back to it. Um, lots of other organizations have leadership models and we should look to them. One that I saw in both other nonprofit organizations that I've been, um, part of that I think is extremely valuable. And that would be, that would be the Boy Scouts and the Masons. Everybody gets a turn and everybody escalates up. And that happens in both those organizations. And I think it's a darn good idea for us. Now, maybe not quite literally everybody gets a turn, but if you've got, if you've got a shire and it's got 10 people, you should have leadership for five years. Like you really should. Um, and maybe those people aren't sure they want to do it. You help them. You start them in the lower offices. You start them running events, parts of events, all that stuff, and they grow their way up. And maybe you've got a duchy with 30 people. There may not be 15 years for everybody to get a chance, okay? But there really is a lot of time for a lot of people to get chances. And I'm not saying there's no value in having the same person be king or, or duke or sheriff again and again, but I always want to give the new person a chance. I don't think this is something we touched on. Uh, it's how you present yourself in a way because you're the leader. So a lot of people are looking to you for advice, inspiration, just to generally lead. So you kind of have to almost grow yourself and realize what your faults are. Um, I know there are some monarchs out there that will uh, 
like, they'll just be negative. They'll look at all the negatives and just like, oh, well, I can't do this because of X or this is happening because of Y. Try to look at the positives and lead by example. I'm not saying that you have to ignore all the negatives because eventually you do have to address the negatives, but learn from those and try to turn it into a positive experience. Um, M Hog, his whole like relentless positivity that he's been putting out on the amp guard like every couple of weeks. I really enjoy that. And I feel that's something that a lot of us need, especially when we have the quote unquote dumpster fires that seem to erupt once a month. I mean, we need to, as leaders, let people know, hey, this is not like this is not the game. Like this is just kind of like a unfortunate side effect of the game, but there's a lot more positive than the negative. And like when the negative starts to outweigh the positive, that's when we kind of have to take a step back and go, okay, how do we fix this? Uh, in regards to the specific topic of nurturing future leaders, uh, it comes down to three points for me that I wish that people would take away from this. And the first one is um, look for and encourage passion. Uh, the second one uh, is learn to lead by being unafraid and be kind. And the third is to learn to communicate by listening first and talking second. I think if you do those three things, you'll have no trouble nurturing future leadership in your talk. Raj, it's one last follow-up. And piggyback on you just for a second. Listen to understand. Don't listen to respond. That, that right there can kill almost all communication. Is like you already have what you want to say set up and ready instead of like hearing where the other person is coming from. So, yeah, whenever you do engage in those conversations, pause, like reflect, respond. And, and that is going to open up your mind as well and as far as the relentless positivity sometimes i see things on there and like it makes me look in instead of out at the game i have to look in and i'm like do i even touch on that topic it just be honest with yourself in in any role that you take in amp guard be honest with yourself and i think that you'll do great i think it's a great way to kind of Drop the mic and call it an afternoon. So thank you all so very much. If I could, a quick round of applause for the panel members. A big round of applause for the amazing volunteer team that put this together. And again, thanks everybody. Enjoy the rest of your event.